Thank you. Thank you. Dean Saloner, graduates, family, friends, faculty, Dean Joss, the Honorable Condoleezza Rice. I'm sorry that uh, R.J. Miller could not be here today. He would be the one person in this gathering that would refer to me as that young man. <laughs> I graduated from this school in 1962, more than half a century ago. It was a time when jet travel was just beginning with the introduction of the Boeing 707. There was no Silicon Valley, per se. There were no fax machines. There was no internet. There were no cell phones, no iPads. The latest technology, technological development was the color TV. There was no such thing as venture capital. The number one company in the world was General Motors. The biggest firm on Wall Street was Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Finner, and Smith. Commercial banks were not allowed to engage in investment banking activities, and there was no birth control pill. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing in my journey that has any specific application for what awaits you. In so many ways, today's talk could be called Return of the Dinosaur. <laughs> Why, therefore, why, before this, the greatest class ever to graduate from this best business school on the planet. Why, why did the dean ask me to be here? And my answer is, I don't really know. But I suppose there may be some hope that parts of my journey might be relevant in attitude and philosophy. I hope so. But why I, a person who intensely dislikes public speaking, chose to accept is perfectly clear to me. The answer is, it is personal. For me, it is a rounding of the circle. There is a part of me that was born here. I had come here at age 22, a bit lost. For me, an extrovert was a person who stared at other people's shoes. Shy, insecure, unsure of what I wanted to do with my life. Two years later, I left, much better educated. I was still shy and insecure, but I knew what I wanted to do if only I could pull it off. And that was to bring to life the business plan written in Frank Schallenberger's entrepreneurship class. So I returned, 52 years after my own graduation, to this place, this magical place, which is an extended part of me. A return to say thank you here where all the aspiration began. In the summer between my first and second year, I had had a long existential debate with myself, finally concluding that I would, before going to work for 40 years, take one year to go around the world, looking for education, for enlightenment, looking for myself. And in the winter term of my second year, I took that entrepreneurship class whose road led to Japan. So after putting in my required two weeks of US Army summer camp at Fort Ord, selling my car, saying bon voyage to parents and sisters, I set out with Gary Carter, who I met when we were both living in Carruthers Hall. In September, we were ready to go. We drove down El Camino to the liquor store that was the ticket agent for Standard Airways, a discount charter airline. For $80, we got on a Convair 880 a prop, of course, leading from Moffett Field eight hours to Hawaii. We would surf in the mornings and sell encyclopedias door to door in the early evening. I am sure I am only, the only graduate in the history of this school whose first job after graduation was selling encyclopedias. <laughs> after a month of this, I was ready to go on, but Gary had met a girl he liked a little too much to leave, so now I'm stuck with a decision. Go home or not go at all. I loved Japan instantly. The people were friendly and many parts of the country, countryside scenic. And the yen was 360 to the dollar. So, so many things were affordable, like hotel rooms and meals and athletic shoes. 
After a week, I had wound my way to Kobe, which was the headquarters of Anitsuka Company Limited, manufacturer of Tiger Athletic Shoes, which I had identified as the best quality, the ones with the best chance of getting a piece of the U.S. market. I called on the telephone and explained I was a U.S. businessman in town, and I had an interest in distributing their shoes in the United States. I got an appointment. I donned my one business suit, Brooks Brothers, with a blue Oxford shirt, black necktie, slipped on my black Bailey loafers, and took a taxi to the wrong location. <laughs> I couldn't read the signs. <laughs> I had gone to the showroom. They wanted me at the manufacturing facility completely on the other side of town. So I show up a half hour late. I am already nervous, and even though it was a cool day, I was sweating heavily. I met at the door by a 30-ish man, Ken Miyazaki, who greets me warmly and ushers me through to a conference room in the back of the building. On the way to the room, we pass through the accounting department, which has about 20 employees. They all stand up and bow. The big businessman from the US, don't you know? <laughs> my entire assets are on my body. <laughs> that business suit and my round-the-world airline ticket. It occurred to me that I might not get out of there alive. <laughs> there are half a dozen Japanese businessmen waiting in the conference room. How does a shy, insecure person make a sales presentation? Sell as if your life depended on it, which it sort of did, didn't it? <clears throat> but I must confess, when I said I sold encyclopedias door-to-door -door in Honolulu, it was a little imprecise. I called on houses door-to-door -to -door, trying to sell encyclopedias. I never actually closed a sale. <laughs> After a very awkward beginning, we got into the specifics about what was needed for the U.S. market. The talks warm up and eventually become enthusiastic. They have been thinking about getting into the U.S. market and have several track and field sample models built on patterns of the U.S. foot. They have an all-purpose model they call the limber up. They have a high jump model called the spring up and a shot discus shoe they call the throw-up. <laughs> I might be able to help them. <laughs> so we end with me placing an order of 15 pair of samples. And after I leave, I sit alone on a chair in the chaotic Osaka airport and ask myself again, where am I going? I am very excited about the meeting with Anitsuka, and one part says, this is exactly what I want. I should race home and get this business going. The other said, if you don't go around the world now, you will not go for four or five decades. I flew to Hong Kong, which is a good thing. The samples didn't arrive for 14 months. When the samples finally came in, I showed them to my old coach, Bill Bowerman, who was so impressed he asked to let him in on the deal. We shook hands on a 50-50 partnership, and each of us put up $500. We bought 300 pair of shoes. First year sales were $8,000. We made a $250 profit. In 1964, my life got busy. By day, I was a CPA for Price Waterhouse. My Army Reserve requirement takes up two days, two Tuesday nights a month, and one all day Sunday, plus two weeks in the summer. Dating with mixed success, and all the while, my real love is that little company that Bowerman and I have started. We get to $100,000 in sales. We get to $500,000, then a million. I multitask. I can drive a car, eating McDonald's filet of fish sticks, and reading the newspaper all at the same time. <laughs> I was pretty efficient for a couple of years until I rear-ended the car in front of me. <laughs> it took a lot of time to get insurance companies lined up, my own car repaired, and the cuts on my forehead fixed, so I don't do that anymore. <laughs> By 1972, we got to $2 million in sales with a 3% net profit, but it hadn't been easy. After all, $500 a piece doesn't provide much equity, even for $2 million. I had tossed in most of my Price Waterhouse checks for four years, but I was spending four days a week at the bank trying to convince them to give us a little more credit. By now, I've quit Price Waterhouse, and I'm going full time. And somewhere in the process, my search for credit put me in touch with Nicho Iwai, the sixth largest Japanese trading company with annual sales of $100 billion. We began developing a positive relationship. Meanwhile, Anitsuka had brought a 32-year-old hotshot, Shoji Katami, with a charge to expand export sales. Export sales were primarily us. So young Mr. Katami brings me the following offer. Tell us 51% of your company at book value, or we'll set up other distributors. 
regardless of what that piece of paper that we signed says. With Katami's ultimatum, I did an instant cost-benefit analysis, which led me to this dilemma. How do you say go to hell in Japanese? <laughs> so there I am, 34 years old, married, a three-year-old son, 80% mortgage on my house, 45 employees, a personal guarantee of the $750,000 company loan, inventory going more obsolete by the day, and no new product to sell. We had a team that had taken, that had been nothing eight years before and built it up to become recognized in the sporting goods world. And that team had designed the three top selling Tiger running shoes. We had a large pot of coffee and the support of the sixth largest Japanese trading company. And that trading company could and did introduce us to every shoe factory in Japan and provided the financing to import those products. But then there was the little matter of the lawsuits, plural, one in the US, one in Japan. I get my cousin, Doug Hauser, Stanford Law, 1960, to take our case on a contingent fee. It took three years. We won both suits. Meanwhile, we paid $35 to a graphic arts student at Portland State College to give a rendition of the side logo in the shoe, the logo now called the swoosh. Years later, she was interviewed by the Portland Oregon and asked her what her second biggest project was. She answered, Walla, wallpaper for a Walla Walla motel. <laughs> We had each of the 45 employees submit a suggestion for a brand name. Jeff Johnson, 1963 Stanford graduate, who I had met on a workout at Angel Field and who was our first employee, submitted the name Nike. Well, I said, I don't really like it that much, but it's better than any of the other 44, and hope, <laughs> hopefully it will grow on us. We were no longer limited to track and field shoes. So we bought, brought in wrestling shoes, tennis shoes, basketball shoes as well. And sales grew to $3.2 million, but our first, we had our first ever loss. Plus one other little problem. We got kicked out of our bank. Too much leverage, not enough cash. The state of Oregon only had two big banks, and we'd been thrown out of the other one two years before. Nisha Wewai stood in for the bank until we found one, the first state bank of Milwaukee, Oregon. A small bank, but we made it work. So there I was, sitting at my desk, more relaxed than any time in more than a decade. In the period between getting cut off by Tiger and establishing a banking relationship with the First State Bank of Milwaukee, Oregon, sales, mainly through the introduction of the running shoe with a waffle sole, had risen to $25 million with solid profitability. profitability. Oh, yes. But at the top of the morning mail, letterhead said, United States Customs, the announcement that this is an important letter. It turned out to be so. Attached was an invoice for past due customs duties of $25 million. The exact same number as our total sales for the year. I had no idea what they were talking about. So what we find out is there's a little used part of the customs code dating back to the 1930s. Duty in three categories, benzedrine chemicals, cherry stone clams, and athletic footwear with synthetic uppers could be assessed, not the factory cost of the goods, but on the American wholesale selling price of those goods, if in fact goods were like or similar, if you like that language, to American manufactured goods. So here comes this invoice. And in spite of the fact that we had been charged and paid the amounts that we had been invoiced for, we'd been invoiced for previously, our prices had been based on that and long ago been sold. The $25 million was on top of that. Well, but things were fuzzy and unclear. One thing, fuzzy and unclear, one thing was absolutely certain. No way we were going to be able to pay that amount of money. So I go to Washington, D.C., reaching as high up in the political ladder as I can. When first contemplating imported nylon upper running shoes, we had asked Customs for a ruling on what the duty would be. When shown the letter signed by the Assistant Director of Customs stating our duty would be 20% of the factory cost, not the double that that we were being assessed, the response of John P. Simpson, Deputy Assistant Secretary, well, that letter is not binding on U.S. Customs. In other words, we lied to you. You screwed up. You trusted us. And gradually, we began to figure it out. This obscure rule had been on the books for nearly half a century, and now U.S. shoe manufacturers, Converse and others, banded together to lobby the government to apply the extra duty on athletic shoe imports in general, and us in particular. They had to make something that met the test of a customs officer who likely had never worked in a shoe factory, as in like or similar. And they then had to sell only a few of those shoes to hugely increase the cost of our shoes going forward if, in fact, the retroactive part didn't put us out of business, which it nearly did. 
Thus began the great ASP fight, a fight for our very lives. It lasted three years. I am in the sneaker business, and I've got to have a Washington, D.C. lobbyist. Most lobbying firms on K Street were more than willing to take our case for a fee of $1,000 an hour. We hired Jay Edwards, Stanford 68. He had just opened an office representing Portland General Electric, the Oregon Public Utility, and the Nez Perce Indians. And now, for a retainer of $300 a month, us. Any over, around, and through. We fought like bastards. Our cause was just, the government was aligned with the forces of evil, and if we lost, if we lost, we were kaput. But I believe that fight made a huge imprint on our culture, which lasts to this day. We joined the American footwear manufacturers and then sued them. <laughs> we made an inflammatory TV commercial, which ended with the tagline, if this little shoe company goes out of business, a little bit of Yankee freedom dies with us. No reputable TV network or channel would show it. <laughs> we got on the air on a New England religious channel between 12 and 1 in the morning. <laughs> it generated three letters, all of them positive. <laughs> that having failed, we took a portable TV set showing the ad during the presidential campaign of 1976, showing it in cafeterias, diners, and pizza parlors all over New Hampshire and that managed to get the attention of the political establishment at least a little bit. And there was lots of shoe leather in D.C., including plenty of my own. We had support from the Oregon delegation, plus Al Gore and Jim Sasser of Tennessee, where we had our central warehouse. In one of our meetings at Treasury, the official said, you can tell your Senator Hatfield to quit calling. It's not doing you any good. I left his office and called Mark Heidfeld's office and said, keep up the good work. <laughs> Our one in-house lawyer, Rich Worskill, Stanford 68, lived for two years in Washington, D.C. He and Jay Edwards simply outworked, outthought, outemotioned the opposition and did a better job in this case than any of those K Street lawyers would have. And perhaps our best maneuver, we came up with this one. We had a factory in Exeter, New Hampshire, making 15,000 pair a month. What if we created a second line, knocked off ourselves, selling the discounters a very low but marginally profitable price, no one could copy us closer than we could copy ourselves. When this first came up in a brainstorming session, everybody laughed at its absurdity. But then we looked at each other. The whole law was absurd. And it evolved into, eventually, let's try it. Thus was born the one line, which over a couple years sold a couple thousand pairs and reduced the increase in our duties by two thirds. And after three years of fighting, we settled the great ASP customs battle for $9 million, approximately one-third of the former demand. And in those three years, our sales had grown to $140 million, and we could actually pay the bill. One year after the settlement, we got ASP eliminated from, all, from the entire U.S. Customs Code for benzidine chemicals and cherry stone clams, as well as footwear with synthetic covers. While we had reached the critical mass to go public, all during the ASP years, we could not go public because we could not accurately report earnings, which were very materially affected by the ultimate ASP resolution. With the resolution of ASP, a public offering was open to us. And in December 1980, we did just that. And from that point, the only thing standing in the way of real success, of having our dreams come true, was ourselves. I don't really like lessons learned type lectures, but there have been a few along the way. And on this special occasion, I can't help myself. Indulge me, I'll not be doing this again. <laughs> now that you have graduated, the goal should not be to seek a job or even a career, but to seek a calling. That search has just begun. In your time here, you've probably gone through 50 or 100 different case studies. And in the years ahead, you'll probably go through thousands more. Those case studies are not about decision making, not even about judgment. They're about a search for wisdom. I have in my travels occasionally met promising young people who insist they are not going to ask for help along the way. They want to figure it out themselves. Mine was the opposite approach. It is hard enough out there. 
get all the help you can. Getting help really is just a part of a lifelong search for wisdom. Here are just a few of the people who stooped to help us along the way, and all but one of the following began their help before we were ever a public company. Chuck Robinson, Deputy Secretary of State to Henry Kissinger. Jill Conway, President of Smith College. Dick Donahue, at 28 years old, the Congressional Liaison for John Kennedy. Ralph D'Annunzio, President of the New York Stock Exchange. Tom Paine, the Executive Director of Nassau. Masaru Hayami, the President of Nisho EY. As we increased our volume, we became Nisho EY's most profitable customer in the world, which got me into meetings with their CBO, CEO. We developed a friendship, and for five years in a row, I spent a weekend with him and his wife at their beach cabin near Atami, which wasn't just a pleasant weekend. It was also a tutorial on business and leadership. Two years after he stepped down from Nisho, Masaru Hayami was named the governor of the Bank of Japan which is the Federal Reserve of Japan. When he passed away at his memorial service in Tokyo, per his instructions, draped over his coffin was a Nike banner. And don't be afraid to come back to the school that spawned you. Frank Schellenberger always raised my spirits when, when I was feeling low and wanted to get a hold of him. Bob Davis and Mike Spence, each spent 10 years on the Nike Board of Directors. And there are a couple other lessons. Two nines working together will beat two tens working for their own careers every time. Ability and desire must always trump money and power. If you can't get financing, don't be afraid to go 7,000 miles from home. Government is part of business, any business. There is such a thing as managing creativity and dare to take chances, lest you leave your talent buried in the ground. And where there is no struggle, there can be no art. And finally, there is this thought. 10 years from now, the first of you will be asked to give the commencement speech to what will then be the finest class in the school's history. You'll be a bit torn. You are multitasked to the max, two kids, one has an ear infection and needs to get to the doctor right away. Your husband is more needy than usual, and he has a flight in the morning to Europe for 10 days. Your company is at a critical point in the strategic planning, and everybody looks to you for what the answers will be. Plus, the company has a PR crisis, and you have a TV appearances scheduled for five days straight. And that golden lab you had for two years has all of a sudden decided it's not housebroken. <laughs> there is no time. There is no time, and then you'll accept. Because of the honor, because of the chance to have some influence on the most able, best prepared young people on the planet. And you will accept, though it is hard to see now, because there is a part of you that longs to go back to a place and a time and a self forever gone. And looking for things to say, include in your consideration moments from the school's history. You might even look back to that time from the deep past, that moment over six decades before, when Frank Schellenberger, beloved professor of entrepreneurship, said the words that meant so much to me, the words that became the mantra for his class, the words that said, the only time you must not fail is the last time you try.